If you've watched this channel for any length of time, you will know that I have a bit of a problem. I like to know how something works before I use it. And it is fair to say that both Kate Walton Elliott and myself are complete nerds, not just from the retro computing side, but we like to know the nuts and bolts of how things are put together. We like to understand and explain exactly what happens when you use something rather than just say it just works. And so while we're here in LA, I've been given the chance to drop by EVGO's Innovation Lab, where there are many charging stations of different generations here. They're all being used for different purposes. They're ones that are being tested before going out in the field. They're used to test the latest software updates that EVGO rolls out across its network. But, you know, to explain things further, let's bring in Jeremy Whaling, who is the guy who knows everything about <laughs> this network. Jeremy, it's good to see you again. Yes, of course. I have never seen so many rapid charging stations in one place in one go. Yes, so here at our innovation lab, we have basically every charger model that we have in the field today, we have a copy of here in the lab for, as you said, different testing of new software, for interoperability testing, all sorts of different stuff. So we were able to do all a bunch of different testing here in the lab with all these stations. So <laughs> let's talk about Chelsea. Yes. Which I hope is named after the lovely Chelsea Sexton, because that would be a lovely thing. It's a good name to have on it, our best charger. <laughs> it's a good name to have on your best charger. It is one of the, the most advanced charging stations that you've made to date. Yes. Tell us about it. Yeah, so we call this, this is the Delta High Power, and it's a 350 kilowatt capable station. Um, normally it's equipped with two CCS connectors. Right now it's uh, just a one-armed bandit. But uh, yeah, so it can do both connectors at the same time and uh, is, as I said, 350 kilowatt capable, and then it's 175 kilowatts each when it's in um, sharing, uh, power sharing between two vehicles. So we could actually charge two of these in one go if it uh, had two connectors. Yes, you could. Yeah, it would, it would uh, we haven't quite, uh, the physics of this layout and stuff, we might have to move some things around, but in theory, yes, we could do that. Yeah. And you've got some new software on some of your most recent charging stations that give more granular data to the customer about what's going on. Yes, so we have, well, two, two things. One is some of our stations now have, when they're starting up a session, they have a little one out, of two, one out of three, two out of three, three out of three about what stage of the setup process they're in. That way it looks you know, like it's, because it is, it's doing stuff in the background that doesn't look like anything's happening other than you may be hearing some clicks or whirs or something like that if the power cabinet's nearby. So it helps you know, like set some precedent for the customer, like, hey, we're here, we're working, we're doing things, we're not broken, just hold on a second, and getting that all set up for them. The other is that we have our session details page, and that gives us, you know, if you want to see the actual volts, amps, kilowatts, and kilowatt hours dispensed, all the details in terms of your session, people really like seeing the volts and amps. I fought very hard for that screen. I love that screen. So um, we have that as available as well on um, both of our 350 kilowatt capable stations have that screen. Um, and we're gonna basically have the, the UI between them is very, very similar. That's a big thing in EVGO is we try to have the similar customer experience across all of our chargers, even though um, we use several different charger manufacturers. Having the same customer experience on all of them with the same consistent UI is very important. So that's a big part of what we do here at the lab is, is testing out those new software um, that we define with our manufacturers and getting that to be exactly where it needs to be for charging reliability and uh, good charging experience. Let's talk very quickly about this cabinet here. Yes. Because a lot of people will be familiar with the charging stations. Yeah, We've got one here, one here, and, and mm -hmm. some more along there. But, but tell us what this big, box does. Box is, yeah. <laughs> so the, the big box here, um, which I'd love to show you the fun internals of it and stuff like that, but unfortunately we can't for the camera today. But basically what it does is it's, it, provide, it has a grid connection, an AC connection to the grid, um, converts that AC to DC, and provides that to the dispenser to actually charge the vehicle. So this is the, what we call the power cabinet and it just does the conversion from the grid to what the battery needs and provides the current as requested. And if you've used a Tesla supercharger or you've used any rapid charger from any major charging provider, you will normally see these 
behind a, a cabinet, behind a, a wall somewhere yeah. or a fence. It's very common. If you go to a big charging station location, you'll see like four or five of these mm -hmm. all together, nicely situated next to parking spaces. And then if you kind of look around somewhere nearby, you'll see this normally wooden fenced off area where the charging uh, yeah. power uh, units sit and this is kind of does all the heavy lifting taking the power from the grid and this does all the fancy stuff like yeah. talking to the car the car the credit card reader rfid reader talking to our back-end system having the screen having the monitoring the session um a bunch of other all that sort of stuff also the cooling system for the cable if it's you know so equipped um it, all of that is contained within the uh dispenser side of of things so it's a cab this is a cabinet dispenser model. Um, I'd say nearly all today in the market, nearly all 350 kilowatt class stuff is, is considered a uh, cabinet dispenser setup where you, you have the power conversion stuff is away from the dispenser. And again, with the setup stuff we found is that, you know, in the lab here, it's right next to it. So I know it's setting up. I know it's charging. I know I do enough sessions where I know exactly each click probably kind of where it's at in the setup process. But Customers don't normally have these right next to it, so it, the, stage, the dispenser itself is silent or nearly silent, so that's why we added some additional details about like, hey, we're setting up, because otherwise it just likes, you see this little spinning circle, um, which is nice, but like it's not telling you anything. So, and so we actually had some customers be like, oh, it's not working, um, and we're like, well, you're unplugging 10 seconds in. It's, it does, unfortunately, it's not instant. It does take some time, and in uh, another video, we'll go over the details of the setup process itself, it's quite extensive, so, yeah. And, and obviously it also makes it easier for these to be designed to be vandal proof, right? This is, this is a very uh, robust exterior. Obviously the screen can be quite easily re be replaced if yes. needs be, mm -hmm. but all of the really expensive high power electronics are inside a nice metal locked cabinet. So no mm. one can do anything uh, dangerous there. And obviously the depth of these is obviously Much a lot thinner than yeah. the actual power cabinets. Definitely. And part of it is the, the, uh, the site layouts of not just EVgo, but all, all network providers, how we do the different layouts because of the cable reaching, because the port location is not standardized across different models and, you know, different manufacturers put it in different locations. Some manufacturers have each model has a different location. So we need to have these long cables and do reach studies on where you know, how we do our layouts and having a smaller, thinner dispenser is pretty important for making sure that we can do that effectively. So I want to talk about some of the logos as we walk down here. We'll see that some of these different charging units have different names on them. So we've got the EVgo branding, right? Yes. And then you've got Signet and then you've got Delta. Yes. And then you've got different names. Can you tell people what the, the secondary names are all about? So the secondary names are the manufacturer. So we, EVgo right now uses four different suppliers. Um, obviously we're at a Signet, so Signet, uh, Delta, ABB, and BTC Power. So all four of those are right now are on our network, you know, in use. And our, our latest stuff that we've been buying and putting in the ground um, is from Delta and Signet. So that's been our primary providers for, for right now. And this unit here, I think, is is different. We talked about the the cabinet yes. capabilities, but this is a different type of charging station. And this one combines some mm -hmm. of the power electronics with the actual dispensing. Yes, but, we call this an all-in-one. But this comes at a cost, right? Um, so when you're at a little bit lower power level, it, the the um, there's less power electronics. The physical size is smaller, so it makes a little bit more sense that hey we can combine this all into one because with cabinet dispenser, um, you know, there's more footprints, right? There's more things to mount. There's cables to run, you know, from the cabinet to the dispenser. Um, there's, you know, stuff that needs to run from the cabinet to the switch gear, all that sort of stuff. And that adds costs. So for our lower power chargers, it's more economical just to have it be what's known as an all-in-one. So it's, this is fed with, again, the, the grid, the voltage, 480 volts AC, does the power conversion internally and, does the talking to the vehicle, all the sort of stuff, all of it is in one box. So a lot of our, our um, lower power and legacy chargers are um, all in one designs where they're you know, 50, this is a 100 kilowatt unit. Um, and so that, that's how they work. <laughs> it's also worth noting that not every 
location where EVgo puts charging stations are capable of 350 kilowatts. Right. And there's also kind of this um, this juggling match that that you and every other provider has to do, where you go, okay, you have to look at the total power capabilities of the location and then decide, do we put in two 350 kilowatt chargers or do we put in eight 50 or 100 kilowatt chargers? Right. Yeah. So there, there, especially in urban environments, it can be challenging to get the power we need. The power levels of these fast charging depots sites that we have these days, they can approach a megawatt above a megawatt, you know, three megawatt sort of stuff. If you start adding up that and go, that starts to get into, you are now like a big box retailer will have a grid connection that's between 500 kilowatts and a megawatt, something like that. Um, they use KVA, but yeah, whatever. Um, but uh, basically for us, they're going, okay, we do need to make that balance between what can we get in terms of site layout, number of stalls from, we usually lease spaces from the site host. So getting the amount, you know, dealing with the negotiations there of how many spaces are they going to, you know, allow us to have, how much area we're going to have for our secondary equipment, you know, besides even with all in ones, you still have the grid connection. So, which is known as switch gear, which is, you know, the breaker panel and then the uh, utility transformer that we need and actually getting the utility um, pathway in to the property and the utilities access to their equipment, which is known as a utility easement can be very challenging because utilities just say, oh, I want this access and this equipment here forever. And uh, site hosts don't like hearing forever because like that's quite a commitment. And even then we're just like, you know, we sign for a reasonable normal business time frames of five, 10 years um, sort of deal. That's how those all sorts of things normally work. And so having all of that, um, you know, be, be, um, be managed with the utility and stuff can be challenging. So that all leads us towards, um, there's a bit of a tangent, but um, leads us towards having the flexibility of having maybe a little bit more uh, lower power stations might work out better than a lower number of stations, but higher power for each station. Um, one thing we are looking at though is um, sites where we have a certain number of charging stations that if they were all outputting 350, that we that you would go over the utility service, but the number of times that you actually would have that happen is extremely extremely low or almost impossible. So looking at different ways of doing site level power sharing is is really important for not just us but every station provider is is looking at this or has solutions towards that. So um, just so that way you know because this is the way the charging works today, right? Is where you have this you know, peak and then kind of comes down. So everybody peaking at the exact same time may not make that much sense. Right, so, yeah. absolutely. So as we walked along here, I've noticed that there's little cones on top of all of these charging the stations. The little hats that we the call The little them. hats. <laughs> and then we've got some, some, some signs here. So we've got EVgo certification in process. And then yes. as we walk this way, we've got legacy. So tell us a little bit about... So the little hats little just hats tell us the which um, disconnect and which electrical connection they have to our service panel. So that way we can keep an eye on like, okay, you know, because if I'm doing testing on one charger, we have other, you know, it's not just me, as everybody might think so. It's not just me testing in here. There's, we have many other engineers that are doing various tests all, all across the day. You know, we'll have multiple vehicles in here, people just turning off and turning on charging stations. We have to know what we have connected um, from a safety perspective. Um, we also are all uh, certified for, um, you know, handling this sort of power level and doing that sort of disconnection. So, um, that's what the hats are for. Let's us know if you kind of look back there, which maybe not film back there, but if you look back there, that's where there's another corresponding hat on which connection it's actually using. So that's what that's for. And then the legacy here? Yeah, so we have some of our older products that we still have in the market, but we still are doing software updates on them. We're still doing interop testing with them. So that's what we call our, our legacy um, uh, chargers. Uh, we, we have them that they're, they're basically either not being manufactured anymore or EVgo's not purchasing them anymore. And, uh, but we still have a fleet of them that we need to maintain. And so we need to have a unit here in the lab. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that you can make sure that the latest software that you're pushing out, you're not going to have a situation as some charging networks have done in the past where hundreds of charging stations magically drop offline when there is a software update, which is oh, hell uh, when that happens. Yeah. So we... we for one, software updates happen usually in the middle of the night, but we, we do 
you know, we and and I'm sure all the other networks do this too, or at least have learned, um, is that you do batching, you do um, pilot sites, you do well, small rollouts first, make sure everything's okay, no funny stuff, and then you can do you know sort of long, you know, faster rollouts, staggered rollouts, things that cause the least amount of impact as possible. Some, that's more of our field operations folks take care of a lot of that, um, but we help direct it a lot and help you know, monitor during those sort of rollouts and stuff. But yes, our legacy equipment actually is still getting uh, software updates. Um, this is a, a BTC, what we call a BTC high power, um, or BTC Gen 2 is also uh, is what it's known as. Um, and so we, we actually have this on our network with, um, usually it's in a one cabinet, this is a 200 kilowatt cabinet, with two dispensers, and um, those dispensers can either have you know different number of modules assigned to them, so they can actually power share. And then we we have a, basically a 200 amp uh, Rima cable for our CCS, and then we also have our 200 amp Chatamo. This one, unfortunately, uh, we sacrificed the Chatamo to do a destructive test on it, and uh, <laughs> we don't need to be able to have both Chatamos working right. at the exact same time. So we still have Chatamo on the other one, but we actually have the new look and feel on this legacy hardware that matches our Cigna and Deltas. So we've actually rolled it out to the fields to, at the point of this that'll actually go live. Um, it'll actually be on these as well. So people will be able to use your, your, your new software mm -hmm. on old stations and that just makes everyone feel reassured that A, you're not dropping support for these older models, yeah. but also that they know where the buttons are and they know what is going to happen yeah, on the system. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's still got that same the roundel with the SOC and we and it's got the session details page, so we're able to have all of that. They implemented everything that basically we required, and um, yeah, we we're still working with them on interoperability and software updates. This is not the only thing that EVGo is doing. You've got not only do you have the the, the actual charging uh, connectors and the physical software that runs in the charging station. You've got all of the accessibility concerns. Here's the Tesla charging connector here. Yes. Which allows you to connect directly to a Tesla. Is that 50 kilowatts? Is that it where is they're limited? At? It's it's uh, basically a derivative of the Chatmo adapter that has a longer cable, and um, unfortunately, it is then it's limited to basically 125 amps or effectively 40 45 kilowatts or so. Um, but we do have these on a number of stations. We don't have many of them here in the lab bolted up like this, but we do have a number of them um, sort of off, off screen here that we can use for testing. I personally have a Tesla, we use my Tesla for a lot of that testing and stuff like that. So um, that's how the, the Tesla adapter. So for that as well, um, for this particular model, and unfortunately this guy's been roughed up, this is one of our prototype plastic uh, holsters that we used, but basically the Chatamo is plugged in holstered here, it becomes, this becomes its new holster and the Tesla connector is holstered there. So ideally, the customer only has to deal with one cable. So, um, and we've done this consistently across all of the models that have this attached to it. And that basically we've had, you know, we, we change out the holster for what was the Chatamo. The Chatamo becomes holstered in a different location. And it's been, it's been quite successful. So, but now fortunately we have the CCS adapter. The CCS adapter is basically only a physical chain, you know, physical routing of the power and communication. We're talking directly to the vehicle and it's basically full power. So there's no current right. limitation. So this is no really for legacy Teslas. It's hard to imagine the term legacy, legacy Tesla, Tesla. I know, this right? Is like I remember when nothing came out. Huh? So yes. So and and you know, and to Tesla's credit, they are doing these retrofits. They are, and I, I just think that's awesome and amazing that they can they can do that for legacy vehicles. That they are doing software updates and doing hardware updates that allow them to speak CCS. Whereas you know, in theory, you could have a Tesla, you know, 2012 model that that was before CCS was out, be updated, and it speaks. CCS, CCS today yeah. in 2023. Like, and you that's get faster kind of charging as well, assuming your battery pack is in healthy condition. Ye yeah, so I know those early cars, they're like 90 kilowatt or whatever, and it's the, there's a whole forum stuff around that. But, <laughs> but those cars still are in the market and they still charge on our network. So in addition to this facility, where you do all of the real world testing before you go out in the field and do further verifications, you also have a mechanical engineering team who deal with things like cables and connectors and making sure that people can lift the cables and 
that everything fits together and properly. destructive cable testing as well. And just, mm -hmm. that sounds like a great job. I, I want to do that. You definitely for get career. the anger out. We take turns, you know, yeah, if you're frustrated. Absolutely. Just, yeah. You've also got a software team that you told me earlier are remote working and you can't go back to in-person office because You've got so many engineers in different parts of the country, yes. which is good. I mean, yeah. it's better for the for the climate, right? Yes. If, if you, everyone is working at home, there's less commuting. So EVgo is doing its bit to reduce congestion in the rush hour. Well yes. done. Thank you. you. You also have, of course, your your business team and you have the team that do all of the back end payments and stuff like that. Yep. In terms of of where the company goes from here. I guess the Innovation Lab is is here to stay, but oh, yeah. <laughs> you're maybe looking at, at, at other options in the future for expanding your engineering. Do you ever envisage that, that you'll go into harder manufacturing or? I, at least not right now. We, we work deeply with our suppliers. Um, what we've been doing is just further defining exactly what we want in our products. Um, for some of the stuff that we're doing, like Delta, Signet and stuff, they, they've been doing power electronics for some time. And there's a, a sense of scale of, you know, where with that, that they can get that, you know, us as a manufacturer just wouldn't, you know, you'd need so many more teams and stuff to do. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, power electronics at some point is going to be a little bit commoditized. But where we really come into play is sort of defining, you know, some of the requirements around screen safety, you know, credit card reading, software stability, reliability, all those sort of different things. That's where really we come in and we help define with the manufacturer um, exactly what we want, basically. Um, two areas that we really, though, actually are much more public and especially reaching out to manufacturers that we may not work with and networks that we may not have otherwise business uh, dealings, relationships and roaming or anything with is around safety and interoperability. So for safety concerns that we see, um, around either cables or, you know, different sort of characteristics in the market that concern us. Um, we've reached out to cable manufacturers that we, you know, cable manufacturers, other networks, other providers with our, our, uh, our cable testing qualifications, just so that way the, net, the entire industry can help improve the connector reliability itself. And of course, with interoperability, if we see problems um, that we think that, oh, this might affect others, we've told our manufacturers, look, you can share this with your other product lines that we are not buying because it benefits the industry to have charging work the first time. Like, I, we're not going to try to geek keep that sort of thing, obviously. Anything, though, that EVgo, EVgo specific improvements, um, which we clearly define with them, is, is obviously not shared. But a lot of the interoperability and absolutely with safety. Is Jeremy, really it's been great fun to yes. see all of this cool stuff. And I know off camera, I'm going to get even more nerdy oh, yes, before course. we ha head home. And I have a truck to charge up as well, yes. which EVgo has very kindly offered to provide power with. But thank you to all of you at home for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed this little tour. It has been fantastic. And with that, we are done with today's video. If you liked this video, you know what to do do then leave your thoughts in our discord chat room or by reaching out to us on mastodon or in fact if you are a patreon supporter which so many of you are and i want to just take a moment here to thank all of you because without patreon the last few months would have been difficult we would have struggled to have made ends meet to be frank and now because of you wonderful people on patreon everybody on the team is paid through your patreon donations except me, because I don't pay myself as much as perhaps I ought to, but that's a different video. Anyway, if you want more from the channel, hit the bell and follow the links below to regularly support us with a Patreon subscription or a YouTube channel membership. And of course, they will always find links below to our Discord chat room, our Mastodon server, our swag store. You can send us Bitcoin. And if you just want to send us a coffee, just head to Kofi and do that too, because on a long trip like this, Kate and I do drink too much coffee. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing Charged Up supporters and shout outs go out to our self-driving tier supporters. They are Mike Weeder, Denny Hyde, Linda Irish, Lance Shaw, Mark Eggleton, Cyprian Laplace, John Trammell, Alan Tupper, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Sean Tucker, Pedro Mora Pinchero, Kyle Hodgson, Tony Moss, 
Brophy Wolf, Kyle Fox, Hey Esker, Tazla in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stefan Framgen, Stephen Williams, Regine Fellows, Chris Ascentar and Jim Vaness. And finally, out of this world, thanks to our top tier supporters, John L. Henderson, Clay Witt, CPO Freak 101, John Lyons, Kevin Barrowbridge, Andrew Glenn, Joe Hughes, Dave Kitchen, Joe Bresney, Nigel S, Matthew Drobnak, Eric Knack, Paul Conway, Stephen O'Donoghue, JP Fagerback, Reggie Watts, Marcel Ward, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Rory Litwin, Ellery Hensley, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on this channel, at least when we're not on the road. And then over on Take Two on a Sunday, you get to find out what either I or Kate Walton Elliott are up to in our garden or how our chickens are doing. And of course, there is also our Sunday musing. Thanks for watching. As always, I hope the rest of your day is a wonderful one. And until next time, keep evolving.